Hey, you guys, and welcome to this week's edition of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week, I have a special guest in here. We're talking with author and herbalist Mary Colvin. Um, Mary, when, when I saw Mary's new book come out, The Herbalist Guide, I knew that I really wanted to get her on here. It's called The Herbalist Guide, How to Build and Use Your Own Apothecary. And you guys know that's something that I love talking about, I love diving into. And so I really wanted to get Mary here to, um, to just share her story and to give us some insight about building a home apothecary. If you haven't seen the book yet, I'll have a link for you down in the description, but you will want to check this one out, especially if you are a new or aspiring herbalist. This is really going to like move you light years ahead on your journey to being an herbalist. So you'll, you'll definitely want to get your hands on a copy of the book. Mary, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for asking me. I love it. <laughs> so I have this like really nicely written out bio for you, but I really would rather hear it from you. Like what, what got you into herbalism and got you to the point where you've written this great book? Uh, well, getting into herbalism was a journey in itself. It wasn't right away. I think I was 36 years old before I started studying. Um, I'm now 50. Okay. Mid fifties. Um, so I, uh, you know, basically I grew up around plants. I love plants. I feel connected to these plants and nature in particular. Um, I've had grandparents that were into gardening and you know, I actually went to college for floral design and marketing because I really wanted to be a horticulturist or a botanist, but four-year degree was unattained, you know, unobtainable to me financially. Um, so I went to a two-year school, it's Ohio State University Agricultural Technical Institute, and I learned floral design. But yeah, so I did floral design and marketing. Um, move forward, I have children, you know, have a family of my own. And I began having back problems and sciatica and it was debilitating. And mm -hmm. I did everything that modern medicine wanted me to do and the insurances wanted you to do. And I ended up having to have surgery. It was a laminectomy on the L4, L5. And I was still in pain afterwards. Oh. And when I went back to the pain specialist, they said, well, you're going to be in pain the rest of your life. Um, due to the fascia, because they had to cut into the fascia to get to um, the L4, L5. And we're just going to give you cortisone injections. Here's some more medicine, you know, pain pills that you can take. And I think I was just fed up. I, I didn't want to do it anymore. And I just, I knew deep down, something was telling me that the herbs are my answer. And I just went searching for some kind of school. And I'm in Ohio, so really wasn't a lot of schooling here. And I found the School of Natural Healing, which was Dr. John Christopher's school. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do correspondence courses. And the great thing is with the young family, I was able to purchase one class at a time. And that way it took, you know, me, took me two years to get through it. And then I went to Springville, Utah to do the one week course and then get certified as what they called a master herbalist. Um, didn't feel that that was everything that I needed to learn. And I still felt like I needed to learn more. So I continued a lot of self-study. Mm -hmm. um, I went to different conferences and I met my mentor. And then I took a, a clinical practice course from my mentor and really fell in love with clinical herbalism. And that's where you help others in their health journey. You know, but you have there's a little extra training in it, especially when you talk about anatomy and physiology and differential assessment, you know, assessments. And um, so I spent the, the rest of my training basically learning that and having clients. And then my goal was to become a registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild. And I achieved that in 2018. And I'm also a mentor. But I found out that I'm always asked what books do you recommend? I want to get into herbalism. What books do you recommend? And to be honest with you, there's just so many good books and there's so many on all different kinds of topics. It could be very overwhelming yeah. for anybody just getting into herbalism. And if you're studying at home because you don't have the finances or maybe you don't have the time to take the courses, 
you need somebody to help guide you. If you're not taking, if you're not going to school, you don't have that teacher and that's that guidance that you need. So I wanted to become that teacher and that, you know, one to guide you into learning, which is where I began wanting to write this book, which was nine years ago, believe it or not. It's taken me nine years to, you know, get to the point where it's actually published, but the writing, you know, life gets in the way also. And, you know, kids are growing up and (laughs) then I did do the registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild. And of course I have my own business. So it did take some time, but I got it done and I'm so glad that I did. Yeah, well, welcome to the rank of, um, you know, let's say system rebels who have just said, no, I'm not going to do it the way everybody says that I'm supposed to do it. I am not going to live in pain for the rest of my life. I do not believe that that Mm -hmm. is the answer. I believe there's more out there. And um, you're, you're, you know, common in that to pretty much all of the guests we have here on Pantry Chats. And I think probably most homesteaders in general who are just like, it's somewhere you have to draw that that line in the sand and just say, right. I'm not going any further. I am not going down this path. I see where it goes. I'm frustrated and it's not helping me. And it would be crazy exactly. to keep doing the thing that's not working. So exactly. yay, mm-hmm. we, we celebrate that kind of rebellion around here. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a great thing. Excellent. Um, but you know, I, I love the way you're talking about the book and it's it's so true. There are so many herbal books out there that are good. They're great ones. In fact, when I saw your book and, um, you know, I got a review copy of it, I was like, that's what we need is just another herb book, right? Honestly, that's what runs through my mind because there's so many that it's confusing. But what I loved when I go through this is that, you know, this is kind of like covers all the issues in one place in a Mm -hmm simple, easy to understand format, whether we're talking um, dosing or safety of plants, or we're talking the different, you know, um, let's see, what do we have? Like uh, how to combine energetics, you know, the plant energetics with your energetics and the different plants that you want to use with some uh, remedies to have on hand. Like it's kind of all in here. Some, even some of the issues dealing with uh, scarcity of some plants and being careful with, you know, not um, harming our plant populations. It's all in here. And so I love how it's kind of this survey of like, this is the basics. This is what you need to know. And it touches on all of them and it's so clear. So thank you for taking those many oh, years to write. You're Such welcome. A book that's really going to feed into so many um, people's lives. Really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, this really was my contribution, I think, to herbal education. Mm-hmm. Um, I really, there's nothing like that book out there right now. And yeah. the only way you're getting that, that's literally an at home course. Yeah. And the only way you're getting that is if you take a course somewhere else. Yeah. I have not come across any other books that was in that at home study course, kind of a, you know, <laughs> container, container like, yeah. That's great. Well, let's see. We're going to talk today about setting up a home apothecary. And this is, you know, kind of again, back to that herbal one on 101. But Mm -hmm. what I found is that whenever we talk about basic herb principles, there's always something to learn from somebody, even if you're an advanced herbalist, even if you've been doing it for years or been studying for years, even on the very basics, there's usually something to learn. So if you're an experienced herbalist, I would recommend you stick around and keep listening. But let's start off really basic. Mary, what is an apothecary? Oh, apothecary is really an archaic term that they used in the past, and it could have been a person or a place that either made or sold herbal medicine. And I say herbal medicine because traditionally that's where our medicine came from. And if you think about today's modern definition of apothecary, a lot of them are associating it with a pharmacist or a chemist, although neither one of them use that term. Mm. So if you ask anybody what do you think an apothecary is? They're going to tell you that's where they can find herbs or herbal preparations or skincare, anything of the sort like that. Anything with herbs. Yeah, great, good. Why do we need a home apothecary? 
This is such a great question. <laughs> this is because, you know, I think there's multiple reasons why I'm an apothecary. Um, if you think of it, the first part is, I think we do not know if our current healthcare or modern medicine will be available to us uh, mm -hmm. due to finances, due to supply. You know, maybe sometimes they don't have the supply to cover all of the people that need that medicine. Um, and think about the pandemic. The right. pandemic really showed us where, you know, we were needing herbs because you couldn't just go to the store. You couldn't go to the doctor. And a lot of people were suffering from COVID and they were sent, they were just told to stay home unless it's an emergency. And they didn't know what to give them. They didn't know how to help them. But if you have your own home apothecary, you will know how to help your body and how to help your symptoms as well. And another reason that you need, I think a home apothecary is needed is if you think about cost, uh, the cost of healthcare and over the counter medications. Um, and the other thing is in the future cost too, you know, if there's everybody had their own home apothecary, mm -hmm. think about supply and demand. You know, they might have the supply with the healthcare and all the medicines and that, but if the demand isn't there, if we're all taking care of our own health at home, prices are going to go down. So I think it's beneficial for the future as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think that's so, mm -hmm. so right thinking. And it's, let's see, I was reading not too long ago that it's estimated that about 80% of the, the um, allopathic medical community, so our regular hospitals and doctors, that they're mm -hmm. over-treating about 80% of things. Yeah. Which means essentially those 80% of things, if you went home and went to bed and rested, those things would get better all on its own, go yes. away, or they're incurable. There's nothing they can do for them, you know, in the first yeah. place. <laughs> or it's a lifestyle thing that you have to actually go do something yourself and like change your lifestyle. Um, and so you think about that, that's like 80% of the cases that are going to doctors, hospitals that should probably be just at home or with mm -hmm. some um, guidance at home on, on yes. a much more local level. And so by having that supply on hand, you have ready-made remedies for treating those things. And so, yeah, Absolutely. not only does it end up saving your household money, but you look at that and you look at the cost of insurance costs in our nation and some yeah. of these things, like it saves everybody money if we're taking care of the things we can take care of at home. Absolutely. And my son's a boy, he's a, um, a boy scout and an Eagle scout actually. And, you know, all I can keep in my head is their, their motto is be prepared and you can be prepared with certain herbal preparations to have on hand when needed. Well, I love that too, because that really brings me to another point of one of the reasons I love having my herbal apothecary at home and ready to go um, is that so many health things, if you are prepared beforehand and you start treating a health problem right at the beginning, right? You start mm -hmm. like the first little tickle in your throat or that first little sign of a headache or the first little, you know, um, sign that you're going to get something on your skin, a little itch yeah. or something. And you take care of that right at the very beginning because you have your remedies all made. I find that um, home remedies are successful so much more often than if we wait till we have this full-blown case, you know, which is where you probably yeah. see people. They wait until they're so sick. Absolutely. They're like, oh, fix me. And you're like, this would have been a lot easier if you had just approached this right at the very beginning, right? Yeah, it's a lot. Um, I see as a clinical herbalist, a lot of chronic situations. And, you know, I don't normally get the people that come to me and say, hey, I want to make sure that I'm the best health I can be. So let's take a look at where I'm at and let's go from there. Um, usually it's because there is a chronic situation. So, right. yes, um, learning also not just the herbs and how it takes care of the symptoms, but you know, what can you do to, for your immune system? What can you do for your digestive system? What can you eat, you know, that gives you the nutrients that you need? And it's all about giving our body what it needs to do its job. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Prevention is always the best cure, yeah. right? Like some of these mm -hmm. old, I love these old sayings because they're just, they ring so true on so many levels. Yes. And being able to prevent things 
um, herbally, nutritionally, mm-hmm. uh, lifestyle wise is just so much better of an answer than having to find a cure for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. So as we're building a home apothecary, what are the tools that are necessary? So there's a lot of the tools you already have probably in your, you know, on your homestead or in your kitchen. Um, But really you need the mark and the mark is the herb and you need the menstruum and Mm -hmm. the menstruum is the liquid that you use to extract it, whether it be water, um, apple cider vinegar, vegetable glycerin, alcohol, honey, you know, any of the sorts. So any of the liquid that's the menstruum. And then pots and pans, cheesecloth, mortar and pestle, or even a coffee grinder is really beneficial. Um, Spoons, obviously, to stir and strainers, um, but really the containers and have the proper containers for them to keep the sunlight, you know, and storing it properly. But um, really, it's a lot of the stuff you already have in your kitchen for the most part, I think. And it's just adding to. Yeah. So. Oh, I love that. I love it when it's simple and we can just use what we already have. Yeah. A lot of us who are homesteaders are, you know, have a lot of kitchen tools because we're already oh, yeah. preserving mm-hmm. or cooking or, you know, doing a lot yeah. of those things. And so we already have good strainers and, you know, those mm-hmm. different types of tools in there. So it's wonderful when we can multitask with those things. Yeah. Um, okay. So. We decide that we want to build our home apothecary and get our remedies on hand. We know we've got mm-hmm. there. We know we have the tools probably on hand. Yeah. But then we have to choose the remedies. Yeah. How do you choose which herbs and which remedies you want to get into your home apothecary? So this is going to be based on each individual or homestead, you know, mm-hmm. and where you live, you know, your environment. But really the herbs that you choose are what's growing around you. And you start there. Um, My book, obviously, I have 35 herbs that if you do all the exercises throughout the entire book, you've created your apothecary, but maybe some of those don't grow near you. So I really think it's best if you concentrate on the herbs that are growing around you and you can research each one of those and learn how best to express it, um, what type of herbal preparations work best with it and in what situations. Um, As far as the herbal preparations, I think it's easiest if you sit down and figure and just kind of write a list. What are all the different types of situations possible that could come up? And you would need some medication. You know, maybe it's a strain. Maybe it's muscle tension. Maybe, you know, the headache for something for pain. Um, Whatever it is, your children have a cold and flu. They have a high fever. They have a stomach ache. You know, think about all the different situations that you would reach for something in your home apothecary. And think ahead of time too. So there's some first aid situations such as maybe they're bleeding that are something else that you want it right away. You don't wanna take the time to make a tea or you don't wanna take the time to come up with something eating it now. Or something needs to be used conveniently. Maybe you're going on a trip or somebody is needing it and something that they could carry. Yeah. You know, that's that's what you want to think about when you're making your herbal preparations. And I have you do that in my book also. So a lot of the herbal remedies are talking about it's used for this situation, you know, generalized situation. So they can be, you know, tweaked also to the herbs that are around you and you can choose your own. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, So it really becomes very, very individualized. Yes. As you start looking around and saying, like, what have I struggled with? What do I regularly struggle with? And what might we have a problem with? And you start to get really a picture of the things that you need to be able to treat at home. Absolutely. That That's a really good way to go. Because really, you know, my family does not struggle with the same set of problems that anybody else's family struggles no. with. Mm -hmm. I have some overlap, right? Like there's a bunch of kids running around my house. We're going to have skin knees. We're going to have splinters. We're going to have bee stings. Like we're going to have some of these overlaps, but we also have a couple of kids who have very specific allergies, uh, seasonal Mm -hmm. allergies yeah, and really struggle with uh, one with hay fever and another with, um, with pine pollens. Yes. And so, you know, really dealing with those. 
And mm -hmm. we have one child who has a, an absolute tendency to get everything into his lungs. There's some sort of something that goes on. And anytime the whole family can get sick, nobody else has it in their lungs. And it'll go to his lungs and he'll be sick for quite a few days. Oh, you know, yeah. so for those things, my apothecary is going to look different than somebody else's yes. apothecary. And it should. Yes. It's good. You're going to have different herbs. And I don't care how many herbalists that you ask, what are your favorite herbs or what herbs do you use most in your apothecary? You're going to come up with different answers. And that's yeah. the reason. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you that just because you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> It's like that pet question. You're like, we all ask yeah. it. And we all just nod and smile. It's yes. kind of like yeah. inside your code. First right? of all, as a herbalist, <laughs> it's really extremely hard to pick your favorites. There are so many. Um, I, I will say, though, I really do use a lot of, I call it sweet leaf, but it's also called wild bergamot, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Monarda fistulosa. I also have violets. And I love violets and I use that in so many different applications. Right. Um, violets for the respiratory system, for the nervous system, as a cooling and moistening herb, you know, with inflammation, there's a lot of different or irritated tissue. Um, I can't go without yarrow. Yeah. Yarrow, yeah. I really consider a first aid herb in many different applications. Um, it's a great amenagogue, you know, for, a fem for the females and um, those with the uterus. And I, you know, so there's a lot of different applications I use yarrow for. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think ground ivy. I really like that. Creeping Charlie is a favorite. I usually like to have a lot of that on hand. Um, burdock root. I use burdock and dandelion, but really I like burdock. I find more use for burdock, I think, in my clients where I find the need for burdock because there's so many people that are dry. Yeah. And so I look at burdock more often, I think, than dandelion, but you can use them both also, especially for the liver and for the kidneys. Uh, let's see. Some others are my favorite here. Um, Gosh, there's so many. I can't think of them right now. What I use. I love it. Yeah, Mr. Patrick Jones. I have. Favorite. Um, I have a whole cupboard of herbs up there. I have a lazy Susan with more than a hundred different herbs in tincture form um, because I like to combine the tinctures for convenience mm. for my clients, you know, into custom formulas. I love so it. I do that. And yeah, but what do I reach more for? Those are the herbs I think that I reach more often for. Yeah. And others. And let's not. OK, I just remembered another one. Mullen. Yes. Mullen is a multi functional herb for me. And I have um, herbs on the market that I rent my formula to an herbal manufacturing company. And there's probably four to five formulas that contain mullen. Oh, wow. And yeah. So and I use it not just for you know, respiratory, not just for inflammation. I use it for the lymph system mm -hmm. as well. I use it for pain when it's due to inflammation. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of different applications you can use Mullen with. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's yeah. great. Yeah. I love um, Dr. Patrick Jones always says asking him what herbs are his favorite or like asking him which children are his Pick favorite. your child. Yeah. Which one? <laughs> Just can't do it. Yeah. You can't do it. So yeah, um, my list is about that long. It's like people are always like, "What are your top three? And I'm like, "Yeah, there aren't any." <laughs> like, yeah, which is why I have three. Which ones I use more often, mm -hmm. and which ones I reach for more often, rather than my favorites. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's a good way to. I think if I had to pick which I reach for the most often, calendula would be in the very. Oh top. yes. And that yeah. I have so many little children that that is like go to all the time. That chamomile. Um, for lemon, sure. lemon balm. Those are like way up on the top of my list, but yeah, <laughs> that's great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so as you're putting together your apothecary, how do you know when you have enough remedies? <laughs> when is, enough enough? is there enough? Um, is that a thing? So I think complete and finished can be two different things to look at. I think that the apothecary can be completed when you have gone through that list of all the different situations and you have everything you need for those situations. 
but is it finished? <laughs> Has it been expanded? No. Um, in herbalism, it's continuous learning and you are never done. You are never, there's so many different plants, trees, shrubs that you will always want to learn more. Right now, my favorite thing that I'm learning more about are the invasive plants growing around me and know, knowing in your area which ones are native, which are introduced and which are invasive and how can you help slow the spread of you know the invasive plant. So that's what I've been working on here lately. And um, there's always more information that you can learn and expand. Plus you could have new situations that you never thought of that you know show up. Maybe you have a family member that's starting to suffer from heart disease or, you know, something, and you need to add some new situational herbs in there for that. So it's, it's never really finished. I don't think, you know, it's, it, you're always adding more herbs and you're going to get to the point where you have weight. You're thinking, oh my gosh, am I going to use all these herbs? <laughs> better safe than sorry for me. <laughs> you know, I'd rather be better, better safe than sorry. Um, but you find new ways to use some of the herbs that you've had on hand for a long time too. So there's always new knowledge mm. to be obtained. Yeah. And I think with that knowledge, you learn how the different herbs affect you and how your different remedies yeah. affect you a little bit more and you refine them as you go. Absolutely. And so it's like, Absolutely. it's maybe not even a static remedy as you go. You may be like, you know, I think I want a little more of this and a little less of that in, in next time yeah. and see how it affects me that time. Um, do you keep notes or do you encourage people to keep notes? I, yeah, absolutely. I have journals and I got this case behind me here and it does have my journals on there. And um, anytime that I want to learn about a new herb, I make sure I have it on hand to make it into a tea. Um, and then I sit there and taste it. And I kind of, is this warm? Is this a cooling? Is it dry moistening? Um, I, any thoughts that come to my head and then I feel in my body, where is it going? Mm. I think a lot of times we're just used to taking the pills or taking our medicine and going on with life. Rarely do people sit down and feel where is it going in your body? Mm. And believe it or not, you can feel. Yeah, yeah. you could feel it slightly like maybe you get a cooling sensation going down your digestive tract. Most likely that's a digestive herb. You know, if you have the urge to urinate, well, it's probably a diuretic herb. So, <laughs> you know, there's, I even had it where, you know, you feel maybe right behind your ears, some tenderness when you're drinking that. Most likely it's a lymphatic herb. Mm -hmm. So I write and I journal all that down and then I go and look up and research information about it. And I say, okay, how right was I? You know, so sometimes I've heard that called herbalism without books. Um, I've heard it, you know, just connecting with the plants. There's a lot of different terms people use for that, but getting to know and connecting with that plant, I think is really important rather than just reading all the different ways or all the different, you know, uses of an herb. And I think experience is the best teacher. Yeah. You know, so I think, and it's not how many herbs, you know, but how many, you know, really well. Yeah. That I love that idea that experience is the best teacher. And I think I learned maybe similar to you. A lot of times I want to have an experience with something yes. and then go study it and get everybody else's opinions. Because, you know, when you start maybe you've gotten a dry herb, maybe you've gotten an herb, you know, that you're growing in your garden. That's what I like to do when I have a brand new herb is I put it in my garden yeah. first before I even Absolutely. know what it's for. Just put it there. Mm -hmm. You can learn so much just from watching it and watching yes. how pollinators interact with it, you know, how it grows, how, how big and, or invasive it wants to get different things like that. Exactly. But then you bring it in and you have that experience with it of, of having it in tea and it starts to differentiate itself from all those other jars of green plant material that you have laying around, right? And all mm -hmm. of a sudden you have this connection and you have this physical experience. Our minds remember things so much better yes. if we can have a sensory experience with something. Absolutely. And I'm fully all about that. I read one, um, there was one review that I read about my book and the lady said, she does not regurgitate information from the internet. And you know why? It's because I'm giving you my experience. 
And, and you know, that's important. It, it is really important because I think we see all these places where if you go from one website to the next website to the next exact website, you have exact wording. And you're yeah. like, does anybody actually know what this plant is good for? Or did they just copy and paste it? And, you know, information gets skewed on things by doing that. And it gets and, a reputation out there. Yes. But you're breaking that by saying, no, I'm going to go have an experience with it first. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to see how this is affecting my body. And then, you know, build your knowledge based on what you know is true in your body. Um, Absolutely. Really and with that in mind, I do want to recall too in the book, because there's so much misinformation out there and, you know, regurgitated information, I thought it was best to give the readers some guidelines on how to research. Mm. And, you know, looking for red flags and, you know, just researching some of those people that are saying it. And can you find other information about that? It's also beneficial when you hear other herbalists saying totally different things, you know, different contradictions. But maybe they had a different experience with that herb. So it doesn't mean that they're wrong. You know, so you just need to open your mind and and do your research and experiment with herbs yourself. I think adding on to that, you know, we, we're we so used to approaching medicine from this pharmaceutical um, symptom driven point of view that mm -hmm. when we come to herbalism, that's our frame of reference often. You know, most yes. of us have been trained in that, whether just by our parents in the, the medical system and just being our participant as a as a patient in that or by mm -hmm. actual medical training. And I remember reading one time, and I, I can't remember what the situation is, but it was an herb that was acting as a balancing tonic herb in some situation. Mm -hmm. And somebody said that is absolutely impossible. An er a substance will either, it might have been blood pressure. It will either lower your blood pressure or it will raise it. It mm -hmm. cannot do both at the same time. And I thought, oh, this is exactly what our pharmacy driven training and mental, yes. you know, medical training has done to us is to think that we have one single chemical substance, we're going to put it in our body, and it's going to force our body to do this one thing. That's it. That is the way pharmaceuticals work. That, Absolutely. That's true of those, but it's not of herbs. No, and in herbalism, we call those amphoteric herbs, you know, that are balancers and could be doing something completely different in opposite directions than you think, you know, that's why we have modulators, you know, for the immune system. And yeah. So I think lobelia was even Dr. Christopher called that the thinking herb because it can be either, you know, an anti-nausea medicine or it can be an emetic based on the amounts, but it can do so many different things. Right. Um, but yeah. And on that, on that note, when we're talking about, symptoms, you know, I usually think that beginner herbalist, they look at that and they say this herb for that symptom. Right. And in my book, I really wanted to introduce energetics because I think that if you understood the energetics, then you can become a better herbalist um, rather than this herb for that symptom. Yeah. And I, I really thought that it might be an advanced concept in herbalism, but I wanted to make it simple to understand so that they get a basic understanding of why we are using energetics in herbalism. So that's why it is included in the book, even though it's a bigger so, book. Using energetics is really a way of treating the whole person and not Absolutely. the symptom. Would that be the way you'd explain that? Yeah, it's it's not an herb for this symptom, but an or condition. It's an herb for this individual. Yeah. Because they can have different tissue states or different constitutions. And, you know, ginger isn't the best herb for everybody with nausea. Oh, you know, it, it yeah, will make you're so more of a warm me. constitution. Absolutely. So you need more something like a cooling herb, like red raspberry. Then, Have So it's <laughs> just understanding that, you know, just understanding that concept. It's yeah. important when you're learning herbalism. Can you give us just a really quick, like, uh, overview of what that looks like, what energetic study looks like in herbs? So energetics is just looking for the patterns. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at um, the four qualities, per se, you know, warm and cool or dry and moist. 
and you're, you can look at taste also. And, you know, look at bitters. A lot of bitter herbs could be cooling. Um, there's some bitters that are warming, but knowing the difference and who it's best for will help you to choose the right herb in that right. situation and for that person. And when you're talking about that, just to be really clear for our beginners, you're not yeah. talking about is the the herbal tea you're drinking warm versus is it an iced tea and cool or is no. it a wet herb versus a dry herb? You're talking about the sensation that it causes yeah. after you've consumed it. Would that be a, a good yeah, way to Absolutely. Do and the book does have some exercises where you can practice as well. And you can taste different herbs yourself and you can practice looking or talking to somebody and guessing what their energetics are. And in your mind, you can say, okay, you need this type, this, a warm and dry herb or a cool and moistening herb. And, you know, just practice and practice is important too in herbalism. And, you know, the study of this and the energetics goes right back to how do we choose which remedy we need in our apothecary? Um, because you're saying, well, you know, a, a lot of you guys will notice when you open a, regular herbal guidebook, you could get, I don't know, you could probably get 20 different herbs in there that's great for cough, right? Great for yeah. respiratory things. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of them and you're looking at it and you're like, well, what do I do? Take them all and dump them into one remedy or just find one and take it. But there's a way to really narrow down which one is going to be the most effective for you. And that is, you know, in, in a large part using energetics and the study of energetics. Absolutely. Absolutely. How do you do that when you've got a whole family and you're trying to create a home apothecary for a whole family? Like, how do you take everybody's individual needs into account like that? I make sure that I have for those different situations, different energetics of herbs that have those medicinal actions I'm looking for. Yeah. Okay. And so it's about custom formulation too. So I can have, you know, you'd have to understand a little bit about formulating and the energetics when you're doing it, but um, I do a lot of custom formulating like on the spot when I have a family member come to me with a certain situation, you know, and a lot of times I'm working on more body organ systems than just one, you know, when it comes to that too. Yeah, that would make sense. I always have this personally, this, um, kind of internal, um, conversation about whether I should make uh, for my family, because I don't do anything commercially or on a large scale, but right. for my family, my home apothecary, should I combine my herbs pre-tincturing or should I combine them after? And part of me always says, well, if I did it after, then I could always have my individuals and be able to, you know. Play and that's what I do for my clients. And yeah, it does. Yeah, I, I have a whole lazy Susan <laughs> and they're all alphabetic alphabetized and I grab what I need. And then I, I sit there and fill the two ounce bottle, you know, or one ounce bottle, whatever's needed. And yeah, but there's sometimes now that's, that's usually a formulation uh, when I'm using more than, you know, one herb, but a lot of times, sometimes simples work just as well. Just one herb can work yeah. by itself. Wonders. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Okay. Well, I'm going a little off script here, but I would really love to get a really quick rundown. Like how do you handle dosing? Let's say we're just herbalists in our household. So I know mm -hmm. we can get really technical when we stop, start talking about selling herbs and all of that, Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but we're at home and we've got people ranging from large adult males in the house down to small children. How yeah. is a really practical way to handle dosing for? So we look, the standard dose is based on a 150 pound adult. Okay. So a lot of times with tinctures, standard dose is 30 drops three times a day. But if you're dealing with a 50 pound child, it would be one third that it would be 10 drops three times a day. So that's how I work with that. Um, the other the other way to think about, and I call them philosophies in the book, but the other way to look at it is um, what does that situation need? Sometimes you can start at a lower dosage than the standard dose, and it's just as beneficial for the individual. So I tend to start at lower dosages and move up 
to get the action that I'm needing. Um, however, if you're looking, say, at echinacea and you have your whole family is getting sick and you want to help your immune system and you you can hit it, you know, maybe 30 drops three times a day is standard. Right. But if you yourself get sick, it needs to be higher. So you mm -hmm. need to go more of a maximum dosing for it to really help you and kick it in. So I look at how much is it needed? You know, what's the severity of the situation? And I take a look at that too. Yeah. Great. All of which you have to kind of um, index with the safety of the plant and how much you can take. You have to know the herb. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. totally. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great, uh, this is one of my favorite things to chat about. So I just love yeah. any time yeah. that I get to sit and talk herbs with somebody who's uh, especially practicing and seeing uh, things clinically. You know, one just interest question for me as a clinical herbalist, are you seeing any health trends recently of people who are coming in more and more for any certain thing versus another? Um, there's been a lot of long COVID I, oh, I've seen okay. and also digestion issues. There's there's always digestive issues and we have to go back to the four R's in repairing the digestive system you know, to move forward, because a lot of autoimmunity also stems from digestive um, disturbances, or, you know, it needs help, and we need to start there. Um, yeah. I do want to say, though, if anybody who's reading my book, they're doing the exercises, we talked about learning and seeing it and experimenting. I just finished recording all the exercises and demonstrated them. And Ooh. I will be adding them to my herbalistmentor.com for purchasing. So okay. if you are a visual learner and you've read the exercises, but you still feel better watching it being done, then you can purchase that. That will be, I'll be getting the editing back here um, shortly. So by the time this is up, it should be on the website at herbalistmentor.com. Oh, awesome. We'll get a link for you guys in the show notes for that. And that's really exciting. Well, thank you. And is that the best place for people to come find you if they want to learn more? Yes, I do have mentoring packages there. So it's all about training and mentoring and resources on the herbalistmentor.com. And right. I will also be having, hopefully by the end of the year, another course that follows this book. So it expands right. on the concepts. And we'll probably talk about formulation and also, you know, more herbs, maybe 35 more herbs. And so that'll be available for the, for the readers also. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mary. Thank you for spending time with us. Um, really appreciate it. It's great. And you guys, if nothing else, check out the book. Again, it's The Herbalist's Guide, How to Build and Use Your Own Apothecary by Mary Colvin. Um, go check that out. And thank you, Mary. Thanks oh, for your thanks, time. Really. Glad <laughs> to be here. Thank you. All right, you guys. We'll see you soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye.